Good afternoon and thank you on behalf of the family for attending this uh, memorial service for Len Evans, commemorating the life of Len, the greatest public servant the city of Brandon has ever known. Uh, I'm Drew Caldwell. I don't know, uh, Len, Len's uh, friend and uh, student. I first met Len in 1978 as a teenager, uh, a young student at Brandon University. At that time, uh, a provincial government, uh, conservative provincial government led by Sterling Rufus Lyon had uh, been recently elected. Um, Mr. Lyon uh, is part of his policy initiatives. History seems to repeat itself, but as part of his policy initiatives, uh, introduced a sweeping program of massive provincial cuts on our education system, on our health care system, on our public service. And as a young student, um, a first year student at Brown University, affected pretty profoundly by those cuts. I come from a working class family, not a family of wealth. Uh, it put myself and my family in a, in a great deal of jeopardy. I had two other brothers that were going to be attending school, university shortly after. We, we were the first people in my family to attend university, to be able to attend university, to be able to afford university. And um, I met Len at that time along with a number of other students uh, associated with the Brandon University Students' Union and a number of professors, including uh, Len and my good friend Errol Black, meeting with Len to discuss how we could best combat these sweeping cuts that were having such a negative impact on so many lives in Brandon and frankly throughout the province. I was already in awe of Len Evans. I couldn't believe I was meeting Len Evans. He was already a legendary figure in this community as a champion for Brandon, a champion for social justice. Uh, a man who never turned his back on a single soul throughout his entire career as a politician. He, uh, he was a legendary figure of the same stature to uh, a young guy like me as uh, Tommy Douglas or Stanley Knowles. I started meeting with Len regularly uh, as a young student, bought a membership. Uh, he and Errol both twisted my arm. They didn't have to twist very far. It was uh, very apparent very quickly after meeting them, that these were very special people. Um, he, Len was an unrepentant democratic socialist, a brave statement to be referring to oneself in that manner in North America in particular. It's not so uncommon in Europe, but certainly in North America. He was an unrepentant democratic socialist, a man always working for Brandon, uh, a slogan I adopted myself and after succeeding Len, working to make a better world for all people. Len treated every person he met with the utmost respect, the utmost dignity, the utmost thoughtfulness and seriousness. As I said earlier, he never turned his back on a, a single soul that came to him seeking help. He was the single most important figure in building the Brandon we now know. And uh, although it wasn't a, a, a heralded accomplishment, it, the most significant act that Len undertook as a new MLA in 1969 in Brandon something he was very, very proud of, and the single greatest act in creating the Brandon we now know was expanding the boundaries of the city of Brandon. It's not a very sexy thing, but expanding the boundaries of the city of Brandon to incorporate an industrial tax base for Brandon, thus allowing City Hall to have the resources required to build a modern city, at that time, it was encompassing Simplot. Today, it encompasses Simplot, Nexan, um, the Maple Leaf plant, the entire East End industrial, um, industrial park. Uh, that massive surge in resources 
to the city of Brandon, to City Hall, to the Mayor and Council of City of, of, city of Brandon, allowed City Council to undertake the important work of building a modern city, and it also uh, allowed every single residential taxpayer in the city of Brandon to be great, re greatly relieved of the tax burden associated with creating a modern city. And Len liked to say that that was his single greatest accomplishment for Brandon, allowing and giving Brandon the resources required to build a modern city. Hasn't always been used wisely at City Hall, but it certainly has had a profound impact on the city that we know today. In fact, the most profound impact on the city we know today. A, a second thing that Len was very proud of is in, during his time as an, M, uh, as an MLA, uh, and something that also uh, was a huge economic benefit to the city of Brandon, virtually alone, Len championed and saw through to completion the Keystone Center. Now, the Keystone Center, as you know, is uh, the largest complex of its kind in, in, the, in Western Canada. Uh, it generates tens of millions of dollars of uh, 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 tens of millions of dollars each and every year to the economy of the city of Brandon. Uh, he, along with Fred McGuinness and Reg Forbes, both who, of whom predeceased him, championed that uh, facility against City Hall, who walked away from it, and the mayor of the day who walked away from it, and beginning in partnership with the federal government of the day who eventually walked away from it. Alone, they worked tirelessly from 1969 through to the completion of the center in uh, the 1972 to build that facility, which has been home to the Provincial Exhibition in Manitoba and the Royal Manitoba since then. It's been host to the Memorial Cup. Uh, it's a, the single largest economic generator outside of the city of Winnipeg in the province of Manitoba. So those two initiatives, which are transformative for this community, one leading to the creation of our modern city and the other leading to tremendous annual economic prosperity for every business in this community were of a as a consequence of, the, of Len Evans' undying love for this community and his undying commitment to making this community a better place for all people who live here. I want to say that on a, a social front, I've mentioned, Len never turned his back on a single soul. Every single affordable housing apartment block in this community was built and championed by Len Evans and successive NDP governments. Winnipeg House, Hobbs Manor, Princess Park, Princess Towers, Grand Valley Place, Lawson Lodge, Rideau Park Personal Care Home, Fairview Personal Care Home, I'm going to miss some, Oddfellows Lodge, Kin Village, Kiwanis Court. Each and every resident in those affordable housing units are able to live in dignity, able to live affordably, and for generations, of our most disadvantaged in this community, they have the life and the ability to live as they do in dignity because of the work of Len Evans in this community. Len was also very proud of the infrastructure that he championed in this community. Um, he liked to tell the story of the First Street Bridge uh, in 1969, right after being election. We're just building the First Street Bridge right now, 50 years later, but in, in 1969, there was uh, a steel girdered structure that exists where the First Street Bridge exists today. Uh, it was literally crumbling, quite literally, like Montreal freeways, crumbling into the Assiniboine Valley. Chunks of concrete were falling off that bridge. He used to like to tell the story where Joe Borowski, who was the first minister of highways and transportation in the new Schreier government, um, Len approached Joe and said, we need to get that bridge 
constructed, it's going to fail. Uh, it is an international lifeline into the city of Brandon. We need to get it built. And um, Joe Borowski said, okay, Len, I'll come out and take a look at this bridge. Now, Joe Borowski was not an engineer, but he was a character. So Len and Joe drove out here, and Joe had made previous arrangements to stop the rail traffic under the bridge. Imagine that, stopping the CPU. Getting a uh, scaffolding set up and a, a scissor lift. Now, Joe Borowski was a health food uh, merchant that sold health food products. But for that day, he and Len donned a hard helmet. They scissored lift up to the, underneath the bridge, and Joe looked under the bridge. He goes, it looks pretty bad. And he moved around a few pieces of concrete, pulled a piece of concrete off, and said, Len, you're right. This bridge does need rebuilt. Would you like a two-lane bridge with a second lane later? Would you like a four-lane bridge right now? And Len uh, always wanted to see an open door and or recognize that an open door was worth going through. said, Joe, we'll take the four-lane bridge right now. And uh, that bridge was built, and now it's being rebuilt by another NDP government. Uh, it's kind of a little funny anecdote. You know, Ed, Shri Ed Shriver's government, government was a very uh, robust, and we have later this morning or this afternoon, Al Macklin will speak and maybe make some reminiscences from, from those, that era as well. But it was a very uh, challenging uh, group of individuals who were all very strong-willed. And the, uh, the anecdote about Joe Borowski and Len Evans scissor lifting up underneath that bridge after the first NDP government in Manitoba's history being elected was one that Len always liked to, uh, liked to tell. On a national level, Len wasn't only a builder of this city of unparalleled stature. On a national level, Len, along with successive NDP governments, but particularly that first Shire government, introduced the Manitoba Public Insurance Corporation, which today still gives Manitobans the lowest auto insurance rates in North America. Um, they were, as a government, very aggressive on expanding our northern hydro resources in, into the north and developing the north. They were visionaries and builders of this province. The uh, health care system in this province was transformed under uh, Len Evans and his colleagues. Pharmacare, the removal of user fees for health care, truly a universal, universally accessible public health care system in keeping with Len's democratic socialist principles. When the Meech Lake Accord was mooted by the Mulroney government, Len stood along with Elijah Harper in defeating the Meech Lake Accord. Elijah was the leader, but he had colleagues that were st stood with him in, um, in rejecting Meech Lake, thereby again transforming our country. Len was the most generous thoughtful, kind, dedicated, spirited, and principled politician I have ever met. He was a beacon to those of us who will be speaking today uh, on this podium as politicians. He was a man that we could all aspire to and to measure our own work as politicians against. Two things he told me upon being elected in 1999 that stay with me today and um, inform every single thing I do in Brandon. The first was, never turn your back on a person who needs help. Never turn your back on a person who comes to you seeking assistance for whatever problem that they may be faced with. The Brandon East office is known as an office that people from throughout Western Manitoba and municipalities from throughout Western Manitoba and organizations from throughout Western Manitoba can come to, to seek assistance and to seek aid and they will never be turned away and they will always be helped to the very best of our abilities. That is a legacy from Len Evans and it's something that I'm very, very, very proud to uphold and every person I've ever worked with together in that office my staff, my constituency assistants, we uphold that principle each and every day in this region of the province. It's a mighty profound legacy from Len Evans and a mighty uncommon thing. We never turn away from anybody that seeks help 
Len Evans never turned away from anybody that was seeking his help. The second thing, on a more macro level, is each and every day the Brandon East office is dedicated to bringing resources to Brandon, to investing, bringing investment to Brandon, to building our educational system at Assiniboine Community College, at Brandon University, in our public school system, to building our health care infrastructure at the Western Manitoba Regional Cancer Treatment Center, at the Brandon Regional Health Center, at the Downtown Health Access Center, the West Mound Lab, to build our infrastructure, our flood protection, our infrastructure, our roads and bridges, to build a modern city, to build our community infrastructure, to invest in projects like the downtown YMCA, the skateboard plaza that's downtown, uh, our parks and playgrounds for children, to build a community where families can live, work, play, and grow in together. Two days before Lynn passed away, Lynn was a very robust man until the end. It was a sudden passing. Uh, Lynn sat on my executive in retirement, on Brandon East's executive retirement, as I did on his executive as a young, younger man. He was the most vigorous and thoughtful person on the Brandon East executive throughout the entire time he the constituency existed. Uh, he was very much looking forward to this election campaign. He knew it was going to be a tough one. And uh, he knew that he could play a pivotal role in ensuring that Brandon East continued to be a progressive voice for all people in Western Manitoba and continued to be the leader in building this community. As you know, he was a very active letter writer and engaged in, in politics and in debating those who were cynical about politics, challenging them, and debating those who spread misinformation about what was being undertaken in this community, and in championing this community and championing the optimism that he brought to the table each and every day in building this community. In your program, there's words by George Bernard Shaw, and uh, this is the way that Len lived his life to the very end. And I just want to read the first paragraph. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. Len Evans lived those words from the day he got involved in public office until the day he passed, and uh, we can all aspire to do the same. Thank you very much. That's uh, my opening remarks, and I, I would like to, uh, to ask uh, Brenda, Janet, and Randy Evans, uh, Len's daughters and son, to now uh, take the podium and say a few words as we uh, proceed through the afternoon. Thank you very much. Okay, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming uh, on behalf of my sisters, Janet and Brenda, and myself. Dad would have been overjoyed to see you all here. He loved these public events, and he would have been you know, overwhelmed to see everybody here who is here to honor him today. Though he's not here physically, he's here in spirit. And he's had, you know, such a positive effect on many of you here and as well as, you know, a lot of people in the province of Manitoba. So thanks again for coming out. Our father, Leonard S. Evans, was born to David Evans and Bloodwin Salisbury on August 19, 1929, in a modest house in what was then the small town of Transcona, Manitoba. Dad was the youngest of four children by more than 10 years, his mother and father had immigrated to Canada around 1914 from Wales, independent of one another. They soon met thereafter in, in Winnipeg and married. 
Our grandfather found employment as a pipe fitter in the Transconacy in our shops where he worked until his retirement. We know little about our dad's early childhood, but we, we do know that music played an important part in his, in, uh, when he began taking accordion lessons at the age of seven. We also know that his passion for politics was ignited as a young teenager. We recently came across a draft of his book he planned to write, and the first chapter gives us insight into what ignited his interest in politics. He writes, I believe that, pol that political interests were embedded in my psyche as a teenager when my father was a counselor in the town of Transcona. Although my father did not encourage me to become involved in politics, the simple fact that he spent a lot of his spare time serving the community made an impression on me. Not only did I hear discussion of municipal matters when my father was in conversation with friends, but I could also read about the problems confronting the town in the local weekly newspaper. At municipal election time, our grandfather relied on my dad to help him compose his election materials. Dad found this to be very interesting and carried this experience later on into his political life. At the age of 16, Dad became, began to attend the local Cooperative Commonwealth Federation Party meetings, also known then as the CCF, which was a forerunner to the NDP. In his book, he writes, the executive of the Transcona CCF was composed mainly of CNR tradesmen who were very committed to the labor movement and to, the Democrat, and to democratic socialism. However, most of them lacked the writing skills that, and were very happy to make him, to make me the local secretary even though I was not yet at the age of majority. He also helped organize public meetings and social fundraising events. In 1945, for the first time, the Springfield constituency, which was then, which then included Transcona, elected CCF MLA George Olive. Mr. Olive also happened to be a family friend and former mayor of Transcona. Our father recalls that he was a very kind man who had a deep sense of social justice, having originally come from England, where he had been a member of the British Labour Party. George Olive was aware of our dad's budding political interests and went out of his way to encourage him to stay active in the CCF executive as a youth member. He also, or he took him into the provincial legislature to see the proceedings and introduced him into the CCF leader, Mr. S.J. Farmer. He made it possible for dad to participate in political party conventions which was very exciting for him because he was only a high school student. In 1953, Russ Pauley, another Transcona mayor, followed in Mr. Olive's footsteps and was elected into the legislature. Dad worked very intensively in his campaign and had the satisfaction of helping him to retain his seat for the CCF in the Kildonan Transcona constituency. The groundwork had been laid for what was to be the trajectory of our father's life. Coming from a working class background, and in spite of the lack of encouragement he received at home, Dad was the only one of his family to attend university. In fact, his mother actively discouraged him after he brought home his first paycheck from his summer job at the CNR shops. Why would you want to go back to university when you're already making this amount of money, she said. However, he was determined to finish his education and went on to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics from the University of Manitoba in 1953. Oh, and a Master of Arts from the University of Manitoba. Oh, wait, the Bachelor of Arts was in 1951 and the Master's was in 1953 from the University of Manitoba. It was a busy time studying and working numerous jobs to pay for his education. He was also heavily involved in the university students' wing of the CCF. It was during these years that he formed the Len Evans Band, which played at socials, weddings, and dances, earning on average $8 a night. On October 2nd, 1949, he was hired to play the accordion at a wedding shower. There he met our mother Alice, who was only 15 at the time. 
The story goes that he winked at her and walked her home later that night, and the rest is history. They married in 1953. Dad was 24, Mom was 19. They were blessed with a long and happy marriage of almost 62 years. The year 1953 was a landmark year in other ways as well. In August, just after graduating with his MA and marrying in June, he was approached to run for the CCF in the federal constituency of St. Boniface. He said that in a way he was a sacrificial candidate because the party couldn't find anybody else to run. No one expected him to win, but he did come in a respectable second and he actually beat the former mayor of St. Boniface, who was a conservative. After five years working at the civil service in Ottawa and two years working for the Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation, CMHC, in Winnipeg, our father accepted a position at Brandon University teaching economics in 1964. After moving to Brandon, he threw himself into community life and was involved in many initiatives, including the formation of the Unitarian Fellowship of Brandon. He actually was instrumental also in bringing uh, additional television channels into Brandon. At the time, there was only CKX. He loved the intellectual stimulation that Brandon University provided and seemed destined as a career, uh, for a career as an academic. To further his ambitions, he decided to pursue a PhD in economics, first in Vancouver at Salmon Fraser University and then later at the University of Manitoba. Our mother had always wanted to settle down in one home and have a quiet family life. This was not to be. Our father was ambitious and always on the lookout for more interesting and challenging job opportunities. However, throughout the, distribution, the disruption, the many moves brought into our lives as kids, including frequently changing schools and always being the new kid in the class, we were well taken care of and we always knew that we were loved. Little did we know that on the horizon was a monumental turning point in our lives. Some of you know the story of the night Dad got the phone call asking him to run for the NDP in the constituency of Brandon East. It was 1969. Mom did not want him to do it. She was just uh, getting used to being a professor's wife. We had just moved back to Manitoba after living in Vancouver for six months. This had been the 10th move in 15 years. Dad insisted that there was no chance that he would win the election. And despite Mom's protests, threw his hat into the ring. Well, we all know how that one turned out. Our family life changed radically. Dad was appointed to Ed Schreier's cabinet, which he viewed as a tremendous privilege and a wonderful opportunity to make a meaningful difference in the lives of Manitobans. When Dad entered the political arena, the whole family was thrust, thrust into the fray. We learned at an early age how an election campaign was run. We were pressed into service, canvassing door to door, delivering pamphlets, putting up signs, and later, as we grew older, scrutineering on election day. Those early years were an exciting time for us all, and we had many interesting experiences as a result. Every poli politician with a family pays a price, and our dad was no exception. Dad often voiced his regret at not being around as often as he would have liked while we were growing up. The decision to not seek re-election and retire in 1999 was very, very hard for him and was not made lightly. Dad had just turned 70, and in an effort to cheer him up for his birthday that year, we decided to write a letter, um, including it in his birthday card, a very special letter, and we read it aloud to him. And it went something like this. To our Father, how you have influenced our lives. While you have often lamented that your political career took you away from us during our formative years, we offer the following as examples of how your beliefs and values have influenced us. You have taught us to be accepting of other cultures, races, and sexual orientation. We were fortunate to have been spared attitudes of bigotry and prejudice. You have instilled within us the value of education, 
being well, well read, and the importance of taking every opportunity to have many, many diverse life experiences. Through your example, we have learned the importance of making a contribution to our community through service and helping others. You gave us the gift of religious freedom to find our own spiritual path. You have shown us that one not need follow blindly, but to question authority and status quo. By your example, you have shown us the value of self-discipline and hard, hard work. You have shown us the virtues of patience, kindness, and generosity. You have taught us to shun violence and aggression and to value peace. These values and more are your legacy, a legacy which through us will be passed on to your grandsons and future generations. And 17 years later, after I came across this, uh, these words really still ring true for us. Many things have been said about our father, the politician. As a dad, he was a loving father and openly expressed his affection for us. He often said he would be happy if we never, ever left home. And was very sad, needless to say, to see us grow up. Dad could always be counted on to support us in any of our endeavors. He constantly told us he was proud of us. He loved family celebrations, in fact, all kinds of celebrations. Halloween and Christmas in particular were favorites. He loved giving presents and delighted his five great-grandchildren with carefully chosen gifts this past Christmas. He had a sweet tooth, much to my mother's chagrin, and made great fudge. You would often find licorice all sorts hidden somewhere, Mars chocolate bars in the fridge, um, very sweet tooth. He showed us how to make homemade kites when we were young, and then we all had fun uh, flying them. We went on some memorable family holidays, and one stands out that he often spoke of, and that was a three-week road trip to Florida in 1972. It was one of his all-time favorites, and we can say it was ours as well. Two years ago, when our mother Alice, the love of his life, became seriously ill, he showed a dedication and steadfast love that was truly inspirational. As her caregiver, his devotion to her was unshakable, always putting her needs before his own. Our dad was a doer. He was able to fix everyone else's problems, but not this time. He exhausted every avenue to try to restore her health. He had difficulty coming to terms with her death and felt that he had let her down. Dad was heartbroken. Perhaps, therefore, it's not surprising that we lost our father so soon after our mother passed away. Over the last few months, I've had the daunting task of going through the many, many, and I mean many, boxes of personal papers, scrapbooks of news clippings, and pictures our father kept. And he kept everything, including the first political speech he wrote in 1949 when he was 20 years old. Going through all of these personal mementos and news clippings and pictures, it's really become evident, so evident, that our father lived a truly amazing, extraordinary, fulfilling life. So many people wish for an opportunity to make a difference in the world, and our father can rest knowing that he did. He will always be, be in our hearts. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, Gary Dewar to the stage, say a few words. Thank you, uh, Randy, Janet, Brenda. Thanks, Gary. Uh, thank you very much, Drew, and uh, Janet, Brenda, and Randy. Beautiful, beautiful words about a beautiful family. 
Len and Alice. Uh, it's an honor to join all of you uh, this afternoon to commemorate uh, the great life of Len Evans. I uh, know that many of you have already mentioned the fact about Len's devotion to his constituents. And as a person who worked with Len, I always respected his values. I always respected his wisdom, his integrity. Uh, but I most respected the fact that he always stood for and with the people that he represented, his constituents, his neighbors, his friends here in Brandon. I uh, remember often visiting the East End Community Club and uh, spending time with the many, many volunteers that would be going door to door. We have a very short political meeting, a very short Q&A, and then we go back to either an accordion at the uh, a senior citizen's home or door to door. But it was always, always first in his mind and his voice uh, that he was here to represent the people that had given them his, their trust in electing him to office. Now, I know a lot of people have joked about the fact that Brandon would tip into the Assiniboine River with all the cement that Len delivered. They're coming out with Ginny and Jerry's story this afternoon, uh, Jerry joked as a former colleague of his in cabinet that Len would come to the cabinet meeting not with a briefing book but with a wheelbarrow to take the goods back to Brandon. But uh, he had uh, always the public interest of the whole province and the whole country in mind when he uh, talked about any given issue, uh, but he paid very, very special attention to Brandon. I think uh, it sounds like a policy wonk issue when you talk about uh, his vision for Brandon and the decision that he made and pushed for and got approved by Premier Schreier uh, to, as Drew had mentioned, the urban limit line in Brandon, to have it as broad and wide as possible was very, very brilliant in its vision uh, for the people of Brandon and for the people of Western Manitoba. Uh, there's only two cities that I know of in Canada that had that capacity to plan with so, such a great geographic scope that you weren't spending all your time trying to compete with one municipality against another and always rushing to the bottom, but you could plan effectively on housing, on recreation, on education, on safety, and industrial uh, development and benefits to the uh, constituents with this urban limit line. The only other community in, Winne uh, in Canada, really, that had that broad uh, urban limit line over time that became very, very wise was Calgary, uh, with the government of Peter Lougheed at the time. And I think Len was very, very wise to push that through, and it made a tremendous difference to this, this community and to the people living in it, as Drew had articulated. I, uh, I know that Len and today we were driving out a little bit of snow, a little bit of sleet, a little bit of rain, a little bit of ice. The thousands and thousands of times he would have to drive back and forth, he and Alice, to Brandon, to Winnipeg, back and forth. He would go from the legislature often in the evening for an evening event in Brandon, back into the legislature the next morning, thousands and thousands of times because he always wanted to stay in touch with his constituents. He always wanted to make sure his values and the values of Brandon were represented in the legislature. And I know uh, it even carried through in his transition, passing the torch to Drew Caldwell. He ensured that somebody that was in touch with the constituents would carry the torch after he retired in 1999, and somebody that also would carry the values that he so strongly maintained throughout his whole life uh, would be carried through to the legislature. I. Uh, I also think it's a tribute to Len Evans that he, uh, when he was appointed into the cabinet of Ed Schreier, he had major economic portfolios. And then when Howard Pauley became premier, he was given major responsibilities in child and family services and many other very important social priorities. It reflected the dimensions and character 
and skill of the man uh, that he was able to carry uh, both economic and social portfolios with two successive premiers in a very, very credible way. Uh, he was very, very effective in both of those areas of expertise and it demonstrated again the breadth of his character and the breadth of his intellect uh, in, uh, in his office and maintaining those responsibilities. Uh, Len was very calm. A lot of people get pretty agitated first time there's a negative story in the press or sometime somebody's catching an unfortunate grenade in question period. He was always extremely, extremely calm. I only saw him upset twice. Uh, I, uh, I saw him not upset, but concerned twice. He never got upset. But once when, when Jay Cowan accused him of dyeing his hair orange at a fundraising event in 1989 in Brandon, he, he, kept, he came up to me and said, well, my hair doesn't look orange, does it? I said, don't ask me, I'm colorblind, I don't know. And uh, he, was, he was asking everybody that night whether Jay was just uh, fooling around with him or uh, whether it, 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 you know, that's just what people perceived. I told him they didn't perceive that at all. Jay was just wrong. Uh, the second time I, I, I saw him up concerned was when we were in our rebuilding stage between uh, with the defeat of the Pauli government and the subsequent election where we, we were uh, thir in third place uh, in the legislature. And one time, I think a reporter with name was Ingeborg Boyens, accused us of being just a ragtag caucus. Now, Len Evans would never be accused of being ragtag, and I just want to make that very clear. She was not referring to Len Evans. She may have been referring to me because I was a ragtag opposition person trying to get news, trying to get coverage as the third party le uh, leader at the time. And, uh, but he was very concerned with that, that label uh, that, uh, that CBC had put on our team at that time. He also was a tremendous team player. And Drew mentioned uh, uh, the Meech Lake issue. Uh, he was, he and Elijah, with the, uh, when Howard Pauley came back from the Meech Lake discussions, were both concerned about the dimensions and the, uh, and the risks that they both saw uh, proposed in the Meech Lake Accord. Uh, Elijah obviously felt strongly that after the Aboriginal First Minister's meeting and no progress in the Meech Lake meeting, uh, that, that that was not worthy of support. And Len uh, very much believed that the spending power provisions that allowed people to opt out did not represent a social democratic set of values, uh, that that would allow for a smorgasbord of, uh, of benefits across Canada and costs across Canada and would not provide for national programs like Medicare, and he was very strongly opposed to it. When Meech Lake did come to the legislature, as Drew had pointed out, uh, Len wanted to object, and the situation was quite volatile at the time because the speaker had properly ruled, uh, Danny Rokan had properly ruled at the time, that it was against the rules of the legislature to have three constitutional resolutions in the same motion. And therefore, any one of the legislature could block the debate uh, for a, a number of days uh, before the, they could be separated into two plus one uh, on the order paper, which represented, with a deadline of June 23rd, represented a real risk for the constitutional amendment in the Manitoba legislature. And uh, it was Elijah's strong view in the caucus that we should keep the issue focused on Aboriginal people and that he should be the only one standing up with his eagle feather and Len Evans, notwithstanding his strong beliefs that he too should stand up, agreed that it was a greater, the greater good was to make sure uh, that that debate focused in on Aboriginal people and the deficiencies in the Meech Lake Accord as he saw, uh, saw them and we saw them uh, on the uh, Aboriginal rights in that and the lack of them in that uh, constitutional provision. Uh, it was a real honor to deal, uh, work with somebody that uh, the term is used often, but not often implemented. Uh, a person who could disagree was never disagreeable. Uh, I, uh, I know in politics and in sports, often is used the term nice guys, and today you would say nice people, finish last. 
but Len Evans finished first. Uh, he, uh, he finished first in integrity. He finished first with his legacy. He finished first with his values. He obviously finished first with his family, and he finishes first in our hearts and our memories of a class person that we all had the privilege to work with, to play with, and to try to make a difference with. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Gary. I'd like to invite to the stage uh, a longtime colleague and dear friend of Len Evans, Al Macklin, former cabinet minister and MLA for St. James. Len and I uh, <clears throat> shared a lot in common. Not only um, were, we, were we both about the same vintage, but um, we started out in uh, our political activities uh, at about the same time. I was a candidate in 1953 too, so you, you get the parallel. I would like to thank the family for the honor of participating in this tribute to Len, who was a dedicated democratic socialist and a dear friend. There's not very much that uh, I can say about Len that you don't already know, but I can give you my, my personal uh, appraisal of a former colleague and friend. I came to know Len many years back through my, our mutual commitment to the principles of J.S. Woodsworth's social gospel, loving your neighbor and doing to others what you would have them do to you and seeking social and economic justice for all. While Len could exhibit righteous indignation at the continuing negativity and seeming ignorance of political opponents, it was not characteristic of him to lose his temper. And Gary has reflected on that just a few moments ago. While he often spoke with passion he did so thoughtfully and in a manner that demonstrated his belief that through reasonable argument, consensus could be achieved on even the most controversial subject demanding resolution. In debate, in debate he was forceful, logical, and courteous. Let me give you an example of Len's courtesy and diplomacy towards members of the opposition in the legislature. The year was 1969, the year the first NDP government was elected in Manitoba. Len was speaking to a bill introduced by a colleague, the Minister of Agriculture, the substance of which was to allow the city of Brandon the right to sell the old Brandon Arena in order to proceed with the building of a new facility. And much has already been said about the kind of dedicated effort that Len put in to promoting all things in Brandon. Here's what Len had to say. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I don't believe there's any use in my taking up too much time in repeating some of the very excellent and I would say accurate remarks that have been made in the House by members on the other side and also by the Minister of Agriculture respecting the very worthwhile nature of the bill that we are now considering today. I don't think it's a matter for any controversy. In a sense, it's a very technical bill arising out of the fact that the province of Manitoba 
I believe undertook to aid Brandon back in 1947 by taking over the debt of the Brandon Arena. And this bill before us allows the city of Brandon to go ahead and sell that arena. Len was into it right away. And then in that same legislative session in August 1969, just weeks after being elected, his contribution to the throne speech, in his, in his, spe in his contribution, he said, and I quote, this is my maiden speech so far as contribution to the throne speech is concerned. And before I say anything else, I want to compliment you, Mr. Speaker, for your elevation to the various, this very high post. As the member for Elmwood has stated and others have stated in this house, you are given a very difficult task. We've seen some evidence of that today. I believe so far you have conducted yourself very well indeed. I just digress to say, you see, Dan the dip diplomat, he was making sure that he was respectful of the speaker and indicated his cooperation in working in the House. He goes on. I'd also like to compliment the new MLAs in the House especially, but I would compliment all the honorable members of the House who have been elected in this election. I believe we're all doing our best to perform a very valuable service for the people of Manitoba, and I really think that this service is not fully appreciated, particularly if you listen to some of those open line programs, it makes you wonder. There's a considerable sacrifice involved, in my estimation, in being a member of the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba. It takes time away from your family. It may cut into your income. And there are many, many other sacrifices that you have to make and it, and it, to make it a truly public service. What a sacrifice Len made. He could well have enjoyed the relatively serene life of an economics professor, or enjoyed a comfortable, comfortable, secure life of a highly intelligent and efficient statistician. One can only guess at the many hours Len was apart from a devoted wife and loving family. One can only guess at the many, many miles Len traveled from his office in Winnipeg to his home in Brandon. Len was a true democratic socialist, unwavering in his commitment to the necessity for political action to affect a greater measure of equality and justice for all. And you know, using the term democratic socialist now is not, not so terrible. Thank goodness for Bernie Sanders in that great country of the United States. We finally have someone being proud to be a democratic socialist. But on the lighter side, Len was capable of bringing joy to others. By his musical, musical gift, much has been said and written about Len's accordion politics. Len could be a real, and really was a real charmer. For people, few people knew that he was an accomplished actor. I know there's going to be some eyebrows raised actor. I can personally testify to that. I'm going to tell you a little story that uh, has never been published. Len and I and others were aware that Alex Kasser of Churchill Forestry fame was defrauding the Manitoba government by inflating construction costs but an inspection visit to the PAW had been arranged. So off we went. Alex Kasser wanted to demonstrate that everything was okay. Kasser put on an impress impressive show. He'd run the operation for a trial period to demonstrate how successful his company had become in the production of craft paper. I retained a small sample of the paper thinking it just might come in handy later. After the completion of our tour of inspection, enjoying and sharing observations of Casser's show in our hotel room, Len received a phone call from Casser 
inviting him to enjoy a home-cooked supper at Casser's apartment. It was decided that I would accompany Len, partly to ensure that against any possible scheme Casser might be up to. On an earlier occasion, I had met Casser, and there was a recognizable coolness in our meeting, probably because Casser, the financial schemer, didn't like an attorney general around, someone who represented law and order. Len and I agreed that we would put on our own show with Casser. We would both act as though we were quite overwhelmed by what we had seen. How delighted we were to see the degrees of success already exhibited under Casser's leadership. We both marveled at the apparent strength of the craft paper that I pulled from my pocket. Mr. Casser served us pre-dinner cocktails, which both Len and I used as a loosening of tongues in praise of the Churchill Forest development. Casser was obviously delighted and confident that he had successfully lulled any anxiety we had as to the manner in which the multi-million dollar development of Paul was proceeding. Remember, I should, should have told you that Len was the leading minister in respect to industrial development in the province. And you've heard that I was attorney general. Now, while Len and I didn't get an Oscar, we did achieve the result we wanted, facilitating highly secret legal proceedings, including the seizure of millions of dollars held by Churchill Forest Industries banks in Canada and the United States. We know Len would be actively campaigning in this election, at this moment. But if there is a heaven, and we all hope there is, he has won a seat there and need campaign no further. Len was a true friend. He lived a rewarding full life in Brandon, Manitoba, and all who knew him give thanks for the dedication, his dedication in his pursuit for economic and social justice for all. Thank you. I'm here today to uh, celebrate the life of Len Evans, uh, an outstanding member of the legislature, a professor at uh, Brandon University, a person that uh, really made uh, Brandon the hub of activity in southwestern Manitoba with the Keystone Center, one of the largest facilities uh, anywhere in Manitoba to provide recreational and uh, tourism and ag activities in this uh, region of Manitoba. He was a person that expanded the boundaries of uh, the city of Brandon to allow for more urban uh, development. He was a person that, as Minister of Family Services, showed great compassion and interest in supporting low-income people getting opportunities, uh, bringing in day early, uh, some of the early daycare programs, program, programs that we did, income support programs. Uh, but more than that, uh, Len was just a very fine person, a person that was completely dedicated to public life and really spent his entire adult life doing that with great distinction, great dignity, and a great sense of analysis as well. He was a guy that could assemble information and show you that when it came to growing the economy, Manitoba's new Democratic Party was a government that always found a way to lift all Manitobans up with a stronger economy and more opportunities for everyone to participate in that economy. Uh, so to his family, uh, I want to express my sincere, uh, sincere condolences. Uh, he has passed away, but he will not be forgotten. And he set an example for many of us uh, uh, that are uh, in public service right now. And I know he was a big mentor to Drew Caldwell and all the work that Drew did. So uh, we will greatly miss him. And uh, I know, however, that he will always be remembered. And we've memorialized him with the Len Evans Trade Center up at Assiniboine Community College. And I do believe in the future of the other institutions uh, that will bear his name and keep his memory alive in terms of what he contributed to not only Brandon, but to all of Manitoba. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you have a great celebration today of Len Evans' life. Uh, I am uh, going to read Jim McAllister, who was a longtime friend and supporter of Len, who's unable to be here. 
Uh, Jim sends sent some words from Ajax, Ontario. My friend Lynn Evans. We were shocked and deeply saddened when Joe Slamiani phoned to let us know that Len Evans had passed away. We had just seen Len a few months earlier in Brandon. He was very sad over the loss of Alice, but at times it was the same Len we had always known, bright, jolly, talkative, and full of life. When I heard that Len had left us, I posted the news on social media. Many people posted their heartfelt reactions and their remembrances of Len as a wonderful, kind, and caring man. Some said their love and admiration had not diminished in the many years they had known him and that he had lived a most worthwhile life. Another described him as a wonderful person, husband, father, grandparent, and great friend who had made a lasting contribution to our world. The Winnipeg Free Press said Len was remembered as Brandon's staunchest champion and one of Manitoba's kindest MLAs. He was truly a nice man who, with Ellis, raised three children while working for the things he believed in and serving the voters of Brandon East with heartfelt dedication. I realize that I am not completely unbiased on the subject of Len Evans. I knew Len and Ellis for about a half a century, beginning in the mid-1960s, the, day, the days when Len was an economics professor and I was an undergraduate student at Brandon College. Our friendship lasted right up until his passing. Len's involvement in politics actually went back to the days of the CCF and Transcona, but when he came to Brandon, he and other stalwarts like Ken Hanley breathed new life into the local NDP Riding Association. Those were the days we were fighting for Medicare and AutoPAC, opposing the war in Vietnam, and building a social democratic movement in Canada. When Len first ran in Brandon East in 1969, I was his campaign manager. And we, we were both as shocked as anyone, not only that he did win in a landslide, but that the NDP was elected provincially. When Len went off to Winnipeg, it was as a cabinet minister in the only NDP government in Canada, the Schreier government. In fact, you could say it was the first NDP government in Canada because our friends in Saskatchewan had been elected under the CCF banner. Without Len's victory in Brandon East, Ed Schreier might have not been able to muster enough MLAs in the legislature to form a government, and the Tories might have remained in office. Len was a member of the Legislative Assembly for an unbroken 30 years, from 1969 to 1999. He was elected or re-elected eight consecutive times and was never defeated. He retired from politics with an entirely unbroken record of success. The reasons for that continued success were obvious to those who knew him. One summer in the 1980s, I drove out from Toronto to vacation with friends in Manitoba. Even though the legislature wasn't in session, I dropped by the legislative building to see Len, but he was typically back in Brandon meeting with constituents. Another friend of mine who was also in cabinet was in his office meeting with various bureaucrats. Guess which one held on to his seat in the next election? Of course, it was Len. It was Len who knew that his first priority was dealing with the problems of the people who lived in his riding and who had elected him to office rather than dealing with some administrivia back at the legislative building. During those decades, Len fought mightily for the people of Brandon. He was unique in that every time his party formed government, his competence was such that he was always central to cabinet. As far as Brandon was concerned, Len's appointment to the provincial cabinet was also groundbreaking. Previously, no matter whether the Liberals or the Conservatives had formed government, Brandon had not had a minister in the provincial cabinet since the era of World War I. Len's contribution was not limited to Brandon. In Len's first years in office, Herb Schultz, in his book, A View from the Ledge, described Len as, quote, a former economics professor who became the affable, cherubic, workaholic Minister of Industry and Commerce and who was always alert to the possibilities for improving the Manitoba economy. He could have added, he was always alert to building Brandon. Howard Pauley notes in his autobiography that, quote, Len Evans, MLA for Brandon East and an economist, 
was especially talented in statistical analysis and his expertise proved indispensable to our government. Those skills were especially useful in setting the record straight by letting, writing letters to the editor of the Brand Sun right up into the Len, end of Len's life. Unlike the rest of us, Len was able to have his letters actually published and he was always presenting evidence to readers in the Brand Sun of the Selinger government's successful economic policies and their many successes in building Brandon. He will be sorely missed by all of us. James A. McAllister, BA, MA, PhD, Ajax, Ontario. I'd like to invite Marion Robinson uh, to the stage and uh, to share a few words. There isn't much that I have to say that is new this afternoon. However, I do have a constituent and um, backroom girl, I guess, um, look at uh, the experience of knowing Len. I'm sincerely honored to have this opportunity to express my appreciation for the impact that both Len and Alice had on the lives of John and I and our family. It was soon after the election of 1969 that we got to know Len. We were involved in that election. We put up our first election sign, in fact, in our rental window, but that sign was for Brandon West. Now, you need to know, we didn't move our location into Brandon East. Well, not for much later, but the constituency boundaries did move. And we soon found ourselves in Brandon East. That was lucky for us, as we got to be associated more closely with Len. And we developed a growing respect for him as a politician who lived the principles he espoused. Len, as you've heard, consistently put his attention and efforts into things that made a difference for everyone in Manitoba. Len participated with the NDP caucus on things like removing monthly Medicare premiums and bringing personal care homes under the auspices of the health system. That was much needed. I was around then and saw the difference. He participated in things like implementing AutoPAC and bringing a, in human rights legislation and later a revised code to cover gender, among other things. These things were huge and they weren't achieved without considerable difficulties. Considerable. Howard Pauley's book will explain that if uh, you have the chance to read his memoirs. But you know, no matter how busy Len was with provincial issues, he was still quick to respond to local situations. <clears throat> and although he was new in 1969, uh, it seemed to come right after Len's election that the city mayor withdrew support for the building of the Keystone Center. Len was instrumental in finding a way for the project to go ahead with a revised plan for that complex. And what a benefit that was to the people and many businesses to this city, as you've heard from others. One way Len's help touched our own lives, John and mine, directly, was after the fire which took down Pioneer Electric on Richmond Avenue. That was where John worked. In that case, Len was instrumental in assisting the management of Pioneer Electric to arrange a loan which allowed this locally developed company, started out as Melco Electric, to rebuild. And a fine building too. 
Many people remember with pleasure, and you've heard that today, of the times that Lynn would visit senior citizen apartment blocks and provide snacks and play his accordion for a sing song, often at Christmas time and other times. It was always fun to help with those visits. In fact, it may surprise you to hear that it was also fun to canvas door to door at election times. And that was because of all the expressions of appreciation that were extended <laughs> to um, a young canvasser. <laughs> In preparing this talk, many memories have come back to me. Memories of events at Brandon East and the fine people I got to know. Memories of dinners put on by the women's group. That was a group that Alice combined with some labor activists who moved to Brandon from Britain uh, helped to establish. And Alice was one of the founding members. And to this day, I frequently cook from the two cookbooks that I purchased from that group, one early and one later. I know that Lynn and Alice made it a priority to attend the dinners and all the other events, as you've heard, in Brandon East. I heard from them they often drove from Winnipeg in weather conditions that were less than ideal. And I've been long enough on the road to know that that was before the highway was twinned all the way to Brandon. I actually remember driving home in very bad conditions one time, waiting impatiently to get to Carberry where uh, the road uh, was twinned from there to Brandon, and by golly, conditions got worse at Carberry. So, through all my interactions with Len, his work, and his thoughtful, caring approach to everyone, it always shone through. And thinking back, as you've heard already, those 30 years he spent in the legislature were years that gave new meaning to the phrase, interesting times. They were, indeed, there were protest marches, peace marches, uh, picket lines for the rights of federal workers. And Len knew in one of the marches, he was often there, uh, he expressed uh, his knowledge to the crowd that he knew the RCMP were keeping a file on him, just to let it know that whoever it was that was in that crowd that day was not there without acknowledgement. There was also a challenging thing in the rise of women's liberation. I think I might have been a challenge to lend myself at times during those years. And and the Meech Lake Accord, of course, which has been mentioned. Those years, indeed, saw a growing sense of empowerment for many diverse groups and raised issues that many, if not most, were really not ready to consider. Len participated and Len's calm, thoughtful acceptance of the many necessary changes in attitude and in actions and the need for improved legislation came through. The way he responded to new ideas, including the way he helped others to respond thoughtfully to changing times, made me proud to work with Len and have him as my representative in Manitoba's legislature. I appreciate to everyone who is here with us today, and I want to give a special appreciation to Len's and Alice's family for sharing their father, for sharing a good deal of his time with Brandon East and with the province of Manitoba. Thank you.
Thanks, Marion. I have uh, another brief series of remarks to read from uh, Josie Miani, uh, really the last person standing from the uh, 1969 era from uh, Errol Black, Joe Slimani, and Len Evans. Uh, Joe was uh, Len's first constituency assistant. And this is respectfully from Joe Slimani. It is an honour to be able to share some remembrances of my friend Len Evans, who I first met while employed at Brandon University in the late 1960s. From then and all through the years, Len never changed a good, caring, and loyal friend, a devoted family man, a brilliant economist, a great teacher, a politician, and a true public servant. From 1960, prior to 1969, Brandon had only one provincial constituency. In 1969, and thereafter, the city became Brandon East and Brandon West. The election was called, and Len was nominated to the, be the NDP candidate for Brandon East. His election headquarters was at East End Community Centre. Many volunteers came out to work for Len, and I helped the sign crew, and Len's signs were very, very visible. Bright orange, black and white, and Len was very successful on getting sign locations. His popularity as a politician was already clear then. One day a call came in to NDP headquarters in Brand East from somebody wanting a Len Evans sign, and he wanted to know how much they would cost. He was willing to pay to have a sign on his yard. Len Evans was elected as the first MLA for Brandon East and on election night a victory party was held at the Ukrainian Hall in the North End. Someone got the idea that we had to have some music and Len was an accomplished accordion. But his accordion was still in Winnipeg as I also played the accordion and it I went home and brought mine to the party where Len ended up playing late, late into the night of his own victory celebration. Len used his musical talents all through the years as an MLA for Brand East and played the accordion for residents at seniors' homes, truly enjoying sharing his time with the people and even with his busy schedule after having been appointed as a minister. He asked me to be his executive assistant in Brandon, and Len worked very, very hard spending weekdays in Winnipeg at the legislature, but never, ever, and always insistent on being in touch with his constituents. During the weekends in Brandon, Len would meet with many people each and every weekend. Some had serious concerns, and he always did his best to accommodate and assist them. Len was always, first and foremost, a constituency man and helped many, many, many citizens from throughout Western Manitoba. A real people person, <clears throat> he will be very, very mi much missed. We have lost a true friend and a champion for everyone in our city and our region. To his dear family, of whom he was so proud, and to, and to Len's beloved wife's Alice's, our deepest sympathies for myself and my family. Rest in, rest in peace, Len. Respectfully, Joe Simeone. I'd like to invite Jason Schreier, Winnipeg City Councillor, with a message from the Right Honourable Edward Schreier, former Governor General of Canada. Family and friends, former Premier and former Ambassador Dewar, Minister Caldwell, uh, former ministers and MLAs, Al Mackling, Jerry Story, uh, Daryl Reed, Cliff Evans, and uh, I apologize, is that Doug Martindale? It is Doug. Uh, and I apologize for other political colleagues. I. I, I, I can't see from here, fellow citizens. I drove in today with my wife Sarah and my seven-year-old son Jared, as well as uh, with Randy Schultz, who served as special assistant to Len Evans 
uh, during the 1980s over a period of, of numerous portfolios. And uh, this was at the time when uh, Marie Carlson would have been the executive assistant here. And I'm here primarily to bring greetings on behalf of my mother, Lily, and uh, to bring words of eulogy directly on behalf of my father, the right Honorable Edward Schreier. I'd like to explain why I'm so honored to do so. For I feel that I've known Len all my life. But as the historical record would show, uh, Len and I didn't know each other until I was two years old. And that was due to what we know is the 1969 election, which would be so, such a pivotal event in both our lives. And we know the story uh, of what a surprise it was for almost all Manitobans. And none the, le none the least uh, would be Len and Alice and his family. We know that Len said after his nomination, he said to Alice, who wouldn't speak with him for a couple of days, uh, don't worry, I won't win. <laughs> but we did. And from then on, Len became part of history. For the next decade, as I was a child, we would see Len and Alice on regular occasions. And my sisters and I would meet up with their children at events from Brandon to Winnipeg and beyond and elsewhere. As one example, their son Randy, who is the same age as my sister Carmel, uh, I recall spending a wonderful summer weekend with us at Clear Lake in the mid-70s. I believe it would have been a, a caucus retreat or something like that. Or on another occasion, in another season, uh, we got stuck in a meeting hall in a Manitoba winter from which there was no, no escape. And we could do nothing but to commiserate as a young group and perhaps there was other political children uh, there, perhaps Billy Ruski's kids, I don't know, but we would commiserate as a group as we endured the seeming hours of political speeches. Uh, our dads could be like that, among others. And it was still, this was still the tail end of the era, centuries long era, of the long speech, the long political speech, of which we were witness and which we will never forget, and for which I am now grateful, now grateful. As a child, I knew Len as a kind, very kind, affable, and, and knowledgeable man. Everybody, everybody seemed to like him. I would not be until my adult years that I could appreciate the depth of his thought. One time in the 90s, I arrived in Brandon with my parents to work on a Habitat for Humanity project. Uh, and I was hoping to stay on the project a little longer than anticipated just to, to, to finish the project with the group. And, uh, and uh, so Len offered to drive me back to Winnipeg. And it was a wonderful car ride back for me, uh, just Len and me talking as we traveled across the province together just for a few hours, just Len and me. And in terms of things to talk about, as far as I was concerned, that car ride never had to end. He was such, such a wonderful person. And people like my dad and many, many others were so very lucky. It happens to be that I share with Len a demonstrable passion for music. Some of you may not know this, but in fact, I started a number of years ago with my wife and some others from the Chilean and Salvadoran community in Winnipeg started up a Latin band. In fact, in the summer of 2013, we were the busiest Latin band in Winnipeg. I'm not saying we were the best, I, not at all. We were the busiest, we really were. We had a dozen gigs in two weeks and folklorama pavilions, Latin fest. And I say this because as well, we, we, we performed two years ago at Houston's Country Roadhouse, just so you know, right here in Brandon, primarily for the members of the growing Latino community here. Now, my sibling, siblings and I, like Len and Alice's children, were raised for years on attending NDP socials. You know what that means? That means listening to, and inevitably, out of boredom at least, at least to start, 
Uh, but we got into it. We, we ended up enjoying these things, inevitably dancing to the classic Manitoba Social Hall sounds of the polka band, which wouldn't be the same without accordion accompaniment or accordion solo. And in that, Len was able to serve. Many years later, when I was in my 30s, and it was my first time to basically take responsibility for organizing my first NDP social, I stressed, and I, I put a lot into it, and uh, I wanted Len to perform at the event. Like Premier Doerr at the time, he couldn't make it. Premier Doerr offered uh, a video taping uh, uh, for the event, and, and so did Len. But in Len's case, I videotaped Len playing the accordion in his living room. And so it happens to be that for years to come, when I hold a political fundraiser on social, using a bit of a big video screen, we can dance to the classic social hall melodies of Lynn Evans. Now, I, I must say, just being here today, it's moved by the words of all that was said, and I do take to heart the words of, of Drew Caldwell as he feels he is a successor to Len Evans. Well, he is an absolute direct successor of Len Evans, and, and I feel I feel I share in that challenge now that I'm elected. I, I share in that challenge, as Drew said, and it makes me just feel inadequate. But it is the challenge, and that is to leave no soul behind. And that the challenges to the human condition, the struggles in involving ourselves in that, they do not end. They continue. They are as important now as they ever have been. And I'm inspired today just, you know, to take my part for a few years to, to, hold, to hold the baton, to, to, to share, to, to carry the flame on his and, and so many people's behalf. And life goes on, and so do the ideals of Len Evans. I'm now going to uh, interpret the uh, eulogy of my father, and I will read so in the first person. Greetings to all gathered here in memoriam to Len Evans. Len was, for me, a close and devoted and dependable colleague, and after direct experience, a close friend. But then, Len was a natural and genuine kind of friend. We became colleagues in the immediate aftermath of the 1969 election, and we had no time to waste or even hesitate. And we were thrown into the drama of forming a new government, moreover, a first of its kind in Canada. That is to say, dedicated to the new democratic principles of striving for a more, equal, more equality in the human condition, and to the idea of using government as a social and economic tool in getting to those goals. Not surprisingly, with goals such as that, there is no end. And there was none for Len, to the amount of time and energy that he focused on his new work as a minister in Canada's first NDP government. In the prime of life, aged 40 to 50, he served as Minister of Industry and Commerce, as Minister asked to start from scratch on a number of new concepts and projects, including a Manitoba Bureau of Statistics. What this tells you is that Len was a very helpful and crucial team member in a government that was committed to introducing dozens of reforms and projects and thousands of housing and nursing facilities and a broad spectrum of infrastructure virtually all at once. Think of Autopack, Unicity, Hydro instead of thousands of megawatts of coal or gas thermal plants nursing and hospital, public housing units built in the thousands. 
the Keystone Agricultural Centre in Western Canada, the First Avenue Bridge, Universal Home Care in Manitoba, the, f the first of its kind in Canada, and Mincom on a trial basis in Manitoba. We hear recently of Mincom, and we see that the wheel is now beginning to be reinvented, that it was invented very near to here, etc., etc. When one looks upon all this, and one realizes Len was there and helped in his usual devoted way to the heavy slogging and detail. Because of his previous experience as, as a statistician in Ottawa and later in the economics department at Brandon University, I regarded him as particularly well suited to shouldering the weight of various ministerial responsibilities, especially in a time of all-out effort. To use a baseball expression, he was a first-rate infielder who could move from one task to the next as necessary. That was Len in those years, and I think of him fondly, and gratefully so, for all these past 40 years since, I repeat all this in grateful memory. But I'd like to recall some lighter moments shared with Len. He was a warm and good-humored person. And I discovered Len was a product of earlier small town Transcona. When I mentioned to him that one of my earliest encounters as a nine-year-old with anyone in the political world was a CCF MLA by the name of George Olive. And Len related chapter and verse of the man's life story including that he had been mayor of Transcona in the depression of the dirty 30s and being a local version of Mother Teresa in helping the poor and all those in distress in the local community. No surprise then that Len was himself as a 24-year-old, the CCF candidate to 1953 in St. Boniface federal election. It is an irony, and, uh, but a happy one, that Len lost that election because the next 15 years would be very eventful, formative and positive. He married Alice and lived happily so for the next 62 years, raising a family of three. They moved to Ottawa for eight years, where Len in the public service with Statistics Canada and then the Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation he learnt what would become very handy administrative utility infielder skills. They moved to Brandon University, economics department, in the early 1960s, which Len told me several times he enjoyed greatly. Events of the 1969 election changed his life abruptly and for the long term. There were happy and social occasions. Lily and I liked to host a house party twice a year, at which there would be, before night's end, singing, caroling, and other joyful noises unto the Lord. I must say that my father added that part for the uh, benefit of Anglicans. But none of this would have been possible without Len's enthusiasm at the piano or at times the accordion. He seemed to enjoy that immensely, and it was infectious. Fast forward to very recent years, I would see Len only infrequently, but made a point of telling him that he was aging gracefully, and that each year he looked more and more remarkably like former British Prime Minister Sonny Jim Callaghan. Len seemed to find that hilarious and would laugh heartily, but I was quite serious. After all, they shared a Welsh heritage, culturally, and not least, politically. Always striving for more fairness in the economic system and more equality in the human condition. They both, therefore, leave a legacy of respect and affection with us all. Ed Schreier, April 2016.
Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I'd uh, like to invite Devin Bell Evans to say a few words. I would like to say a few words about my late grandfather, Len Evans. I felt it was necessary to speak as a tribute to my grandpa, because as a true politician, he often, he loved speeches and presentations. And he often encouraged a toast as a speech, or a speech at special family gatherings, and being soft-spoken, my brother and I often didn't oblige. Len and Alice were exceptional grandparents and always took great pleasure in seeing their grandkids happy. I have many cherished memories of spending weeks in the summer at their cottage at Sunset Beach, which they bought for their grandkids. And I always enjoyed trips to Winnipeg to spend time with Grandma and Grandpa, as I knew they would always be filled with fun activities like swimming and Tinkertown. As we got older, go-karts and mini-golf. Then when I attended Red River College in Winnipeg, I was lucky enough to stay with my grandparents. My contributions for rent were to house sit and look after the cat, Rusty. My first fall in Winnipeg, when I was staying with Grandma and Grandpa, I learned that they were both night owls. I didn't expect that my grandparents would stay up later than a college-age kid on a nightly basis. I remember Grandpa would stay up working on various reports and newsletters for the former Manitoba MLA's association. I admire how he kept following his passion of community involvement into retirement by working with the Public Utilities Board, Brandon University Board of Governors, and by writing letters to the editor of local newspapers. The last few years of visits were filled with stories of the past and discussions on current events, Canadian politics, and traveling as these were shared interests of ours. Visits, also, visits usually also involved helping out with some handiwork around his place as Grandpa really wasn't the handy type. Whether it was uh, changing light bulbs or putting together furniture, it was time well spent together. Wherever he went, he always seemed to strike up a conversation with people. I remember many times when he was visiting Bertle. He would come back from the grocery store and say that how he had met somebody at the store and asked if I knew who they were. It usually turned out I knew them very well and I would explain that in a small community everybody knows each other. This always seemed to please him to be part of a close-knit community and I think he got a better sense of that once they purchased their cabin in Bertle. He was an inspiration to me and I try and emulate the great traits and values he possessed. He was compassionate, generous, worked selflessly to help and improve the community in which he lived. Here's a quote I believe fits the way he lived his life. Very little is needed to make a happy life. It is all within yourself, in your way of thinking. He always had such a positive attitude and didn't ever let anything get him down. He accomplished so much in his lifetime including having a building named after him, and yet he always remained grounded. As William Wallace once said, everybody dies, but not everyone truly lives. Grandpa's journey was a full and rich one, so let us celebrate Grandpa's life and continue his legacy. Thank you, Grandpa. I love you, and we'll miss you. Thanks, Devin. Um, so it's going to be a short video presentation followed by a moment of silence uh, and then uh, some closing remarks followed by refreshments in the, in the foyer. Uh, I'll speak uh, just briefly after the video presentation.
Refreshments. If we could have just a, a moment of silence uh, in memory of, of Len and Alice. Thank you. <laughs> 